Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here in Washington, D.C., where we're visiting with the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments and my uh, old friend Mark Gonzo uh, Gunzinger, who looks at all things uh, strike, aviation, uh, force planning. Gonzo, thanks very much for the time. Oh, thank you for coming today, Bob. I appreciate it. Um, it's, it's always a treat. You've got a new uh, report out with a bunch of your co-conspirators, uh, force planning for the era of great power uh, competition. Uh, you and I have talked quite a lot about that. You've got Brian Clark, uh, David Johnson, and also Jesse Sloman uh, on the report. Uh, talk, you know, we are in a, a new strategic season. Uh, the administration is working its uh, national security strategy, uh, the chairman's working strategy, the department's working strategy, um, and, and, that, you know, and some of this on, from the department standpoint is the replacement to the QDR. So for the first time in decades, we don't have a QDR, but we still have a, a strategic process. Uh, you did force planning uh, in the Bush administration as well as in the beginning of the Obama administration. Talk to us a little bit about what's different uh, in the, the strategic setting. What's different in this report from what you guys put out four years ago? Excellent question. Yes, the administration is currently developing a new national defense strategy, which is replacing uh, the quadrennial defense review. And of course, uh, the National Security Council is developing a national security strategy, and those will work hand in hand. Now, part of the defense strategy is something called the force planning construct, which we wrote about in our, our last report for the very last QDR, although we didn't know it at the time. The difference is this. Uh, we've gone through about 25 years of what we call the post-Cold War period to include uh, about 17 years of uh, conflict uh, in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and against uh, terrorism globally. But the fact of the matter is it's now time, we believe, to take a hard look at the future force structure and mix of capabilities that are needed to deter and, if necessary, uh, to counter aggression by China and Russia who are developing more advanced military capabilities, and we see that on the part of China, uh, Russia is, uh, as well as China. And we see Russia becoming uh, a, a much more aggressive uh, power militarily, as well as diplomatically, politically, and, and economically. Uh, they reemerge as uh, an actor in the Middle East, for example. Their so-called gray zone aggression in Ukraine, uh, Crimea, Crimea, and possibly other regions is uh, also of great concern to our national leaders. Each time there's a strategic process underway like this that involves, you know, the White House, the department, uh, the, the chairman's office, there's this sense that there is a the sense of disunity that, you know, for example, folks say the department is much more ahead of the process, for example, than the White House has been. The chairman actually finished his uh, strategy last year. He's, he's updated it. Obviously, it's a different administration. Um, you know, you've been looking, advising all of, of the smart minds in Washington have been playing into this in, in one way or another, particularly from the from the think tank space. Talk to us a little bit about the process, how it's going, you know, and is this going to lead to that sort of conjoined strategy that everybody's looking forward to? Yes, it will. It will lead to the kind of uh, integrated set of strategies that I think we need to help guide the development of the future force, getting back to uh, a force planning for a minute. So, uh, of course, there's always turbulence when you're engaged in creating strategy. And so there's certainly turbulence today, and there always will be. But I think the end product will be something that uh, this administration can be proud of and certainly will provide that, again, foundation for developing the future for us. Um, what do you think, you know, we've always gone with uh, two major theater regional contingencies, you know, the MTCRs and things like that. As you look at it from a force planning construct, what are the constructs that we should be using uh, as we lay down a template for the future force? Yes, well, we don't have a canonical, traditional two-war force today, clearly. We lack the capacity, for example, uh, as assessed against the kinds of planning, con uh, planning scenarios that DOD has looked at in the past. Now, one of the things we point out here is we need to change those planning scenarios to account for the new warfighting strategies adopted by China and Russia. And that's informationized warfare strategy for China and an information warfare-like uh, strategy called new generation warfare adopted by Russia. And their aims are very different than uh, previous strategies which were based more on conducting attrition warfare, force on force. That information warfare uh, strategies are aimed more at influencing the decision making of our national leaders and the leadership of our allies and partners. 
as well as the decisions made at the operational and tactical level in, in the battle space. So thinking through that and how we can conduct our own form of informationized warfare is uh, uh, something we think is pretty important to developing a mix of capabilities in the future needed to deter China, Russia, and others. Informationized warfare also extends into peacetime as well, as well into actual conflict. So we see actions on the part of uh, China and Russia today is shaping the battle space. In fact, we call it a long-term peacetime competition. But from their perspective, they're actually engaged in conflict today against us. Certainly China in the East China Sea and their gray zone actions there to extend their control uh, beyond their borders into the maritime region. Same with Russia. Uh, aggression against uh, uh, former Soviet states in the near abroad. Again, gray zone right. operations as they have come to be uh, known. Um, you are a uh, nuclear uh, cold warrior. You were a B-52 guy. You have deafness on your left side uh, because you were an aircraft commander on an airplane that uh, does have a tendency of being pretty loud sometimes. Uh, but uh, you and I have talked over the years a lot about uh, nuclear strategy, uh, the need to adapt nuclear strategy, um, and also the tactical component, especially when one of our adversaries, uh, the Russians, uh, will look at it as a de-escalatory step. They don't look at nuclear weapons as escalatory. They look at the use of tactical nuclear weapons as a de-escalatory step. How does our strategy, our force planning, you know, we've seen nuclear play a role in force planning, obviously during the Eisenhower administration most prominently, shrink the force, depend more on nuclear weapons, uh, save a little bit of money. It was a little bit of the strategy at the time. Talk to us a little bit about nuclear weapons, the role. How does that shape the way that we shape our forces and should be shaping them for the future? Sure. Uh, our nuclear triad, no secret here, is aging and becoming much, much less effective, I believe. Again, in this era of great power competition, there's also something called the Salvo competition, which we have written quite extensively about. In other words, in this mature precision strike regime, which includes effective defenses against our aircraft, our weapons, including our nuclear weapons, then the survivability of an Alcom, for example, air launch cruise missile first fielded by the Air Force in 1981, it's non-stealthy and frankly non-penetrating, uh, against very advanced uh, capable IADs, uh, that is eroding the effectiveness of our deterrent posture. So that is part of the case of why we need to modernize our triad to be able to operate effectively in this much more contested environment in this era of great power competition, much more contested than we've had to contend with since, well, uh, the Cold War era, or maybe ever, I think is a better way of describing it. Um, you uh, uh, and I have, have spoken about how precision strike is, is no longer just precision strike. It's part of an integrated intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, strike, electronic warfare is all in one conjoined whole where manned and unmanned systems uh, team operate autonomously. Um, and for the first time, you're even hearing Navy leaders, for example, Navy Secretary Spencer, saying that, look, unmanned, you know, especially you know, unmanned systems may count toward fleet strength at, at, at some point. That has a force planning, force structure connotation to it. How does the emerging uh, reconnaissance strike, electromagnetic warfare, even to a degree cyber enterprise that's being built on the manned and unmanned space, the very large to the very small, uh, to the mothership concepts that are being being developed. How does that affect force planning? Because if you're, you know, we, we have a tendency of looking at, you know, here are our reconnaissance aircraft, here are our strike aircraft, whereas now we're going to be seeing a much more significant blurring. Not that there wasn't, there was always a little bit of that, but with lantern pods and a whole bunch of other things. But now the future we're going into is very, very different. How do the, em the emergence of the technologies and the operational concepts need to shape sort of the force of the future as you look out, even within five years, there's going to be connotation there and impact. Excellent question, and that is a major theme of our, our new report. Uh, when we look back to the force planning constructs of the past, well, 25 years, since the end of the, since the, end of the uh, Cold War, uh, most of them have been driven by budget. In other words, uh, the force structure and the, the 
horse planting construct itself, which is really a set of policies that uh, help guide the development of the force and uh, how many forces capacity as well as capabilities uh, on the part of the services, uh, were driven by budget. And a, a couple of the QDRs, it was pretty blatant. Here's our forest planning construct, and here's the program of record. They match. They're, they're in balance. Uh, so that's kind of a backwards way of thinking about the future and what kind of force structure, capabilities, capacity might be needed. What we're saying is, let's first take a look at the future security environment and then assess the kinds of operating concepts that we need to develop how we might change the way we operate in the future with different mixes of existing and, and new capabilities, how we could harness emerging technologies to give us new advantages through these operating concepts. And then let's make sure we've developed the right mix of capabilities in the forest, the right mix along the short range aircraft, for example, manned, unmanned, standoff, the penetrating uh, munitions, non-kinetic versus kinetic uh, uh, capabilities, because if you have your mix wrong in the force, just adding more capacity might not be the right answer. So after you've assessed the threat environment, uh, developed the right set of operating concepts and determined what kind of mix of forces are needed to execute those concepts, now you can start talking about capacity versus the other way of, well, here's the budget, here's the capacity we can afford, here's our construct, which really isn't driven by a strategy. Although, the counterpoint to that uh, is that the budget limitation is where strategy has to play in because that's the limit of my resource ability. Uh, that's correct, and budget should always come at, at the end. So if we will have insufficient resources, be it end strength, be it budget, whatever, to afford this kind of force, how might we change our operating concepts? Are there other capabilities we could use differently to achieve the desired effects in the battle space? to account for the fact that we can't do it the way we would prefer to do it. But it starts by looking at strategy, the threat environment, and operating concepts first, vice simply saying, this is what we can afford, and we can add to that, oh, here's a new technology, we can afford that much of it, but not, not this. Uh, Mark Gunzinger, one of the authors, along with Brian Clark, David Johnson, Jesse Sloman, of the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, Force Planning for the Era of Great Power Competition, Gonzo, always a treat talking to you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Vago.